Hi Southwest students, today I'm going to show you how to take sketch notes while reading uh, using Tulliver's Secret, the book, and I'm going to read chapter one. I've already recorded myself reading chapter one, so I'm going to listen to myself as I read and I'm going to take some notes. Now your teacher has some uh, different layouts that you can use. These layouts are actually comic book uh, outlines, so you can pick which one you like the best. Uh, it's got different cells on each one of different shapes and sizes, and you can pick which one you like the best to do your sketch notes. Now, what sketch notes are, I'm sure your teacher has kind of explained it, is you are going to sketch out the different scenarios as you hear the book being read. That way you can visualize or see what's being what's happening in the book as you're, somebody's reading it to you. This will help give you a visualization or a visual of what you're reading. When I was your age, I had a hard time uh, following along with the people that were reading the book and comprehending what was going on because I couldn't see it in my head what was going on. So this is going to be a good way for your brain to connect what's being read and what you see. So. Pick the best one that you like. I don't want a big one. I want a lot of little ones. So I'm gonna go, I'm gonna actually go with that one. And there's no right or wrong way to draw your pictures, how you wanna draw them. Um, but you do wanna make sure that you try and do a good uh, example of what's being read to you. So I, for example, I'm doing the first chapter. So I could do, a whole entire page on just one chapter. Or maybe it's not a very eventful chapter and you just want to use one cell for the chapter. There's, like I said, there's no wrong, wrong or right way to do it. It's kind of up to you and what you understand and what you hear to put down on the notes. Okay? Here we go. Tolliver's Secret by Esther Wood Brady. Chapter One. Grandfather must have lost his wits. Ellen was sure her grandfather had lost his wits when she saw him slip into the dark kitchen and lock the door with a big key. Without giving his usual cheery greeting, he tiptoed to the window and pinned the heavy curtains together with a knitting needle. Don't want anyone peeping in this morning, he said to Ellen's mother, who was making bread on the table by a f the fireplace. Lights from a small fire on the hearth darted about the big old kitchen. From the dark corner where she sat brushing her hair, Ellen could see light glimmering on a s tiny silver box he carried in his hand. Is the loaf ready now? grandfather whispered to her mother. Mother's white cat fluttered up and down, but she did not speak. Very carefully, she patted and shaped a small round loaf of bread. Well, then, let us go ahead, grandfather said as he gingerly placed the silver box on top of the lump of dough. Ellen stared at the little box. It was his favorite silver stuffed box, she was too surprised to speak when she saw him press the snuff box into the dough, smooth over the hole that he had made and dust off his hands. His round face had a wide, impish smile. No one will find, out, find it here, he said gleefully. He stepped back and cocked his head to one side. Bake it crisp and brown. Abby, with a good strong crust. It has a long way to travel. You're quite sure no one will find it, Father? Mother sounded frightened. No, don't worry, Abby. No one will find it. He patted her shoulder and gave her a kiss. Ellen saw that she he was wearing the white wig with the turned up tail that he always wore when he went to the tavern. Underneath his blue wool coat, he wore a long waistcoat with brass buttons down the front. He was short and stout, and the buttons marched down his waistcoat 
in an outward curve. He never wore those clothes when he worked in his barber shop. Ellen was so puzzled, she had to speak up. Whatever are you planning to do, Grandfather? Quickly, her grandfather spun around and peered into the deep shadows of the old kitchen. He gave a sharp cry that made her jump up. I thought you had gone to the corner pump, Ellie. Ellen curtsied. I was just about to make the bed, but I'll leave now, Grandfather. She picked up her red cloak and pulled the hood over her long brown hair. Grandfather stepped across the room and grasped her by the shoulders. Don't ever speak of what you have seen, Ellen Tolliver. He warned in such a gruff voice. She had never heard him use before. He was usually so friendly and cheerful, even in the early morning, even with the British officers around. But now his twinkling blue eyes looked as hard as points of steel. Ellen was so startled, she dropped her cloak. But I was just wondering. Stop. You are no longer a babbling child, he said sharply. About this, you must never talk. Do you hear, Ellen Tolliver? Ellen nodded. Grandfather wasn't acting like himself at all. Suddenly, with his usual cheerful smile, he bent down and hugged her to his side. From under his wig, she could see some of his sandy red hair peep out around his forehead. I must have alarmed you, Ellie, and I am sorry, he said as he kissed her cheek. But this is something of concern to me, very great concern, and only your mother knows about it, no one else. But now that the three of us know, the three of us must keep it secret. Ellen nodded. She wasn't sure just what the secret was, but she certainly would not talk about it. Shh. Mother took off her white cap and pushed back a curl that fell across her forehead, leaving a smudge of flour on her brown hair. She cocked her head and listened for a voice upstairs. Shh. No telling who might be awake up there. In the bedrooms upstairs lived six British officers who had moved into Grandfather's office when the Redcoats took New York three months ago. Ellen disliked these officers, always sniffing snuff up their proud noses and sneezing daintily into white kerchiefs when they weren't striding about giving orders. She hated the way they ordered Mother to bring tea and biscuits to them every morning, but still they were the masters of the house now. Ellen and her mother curtsied whenever they saw them and stepped out of their way politely. Just pay those bread coats no mind, her grandfather had told them. Sometimes in the evenings he would mimic them. He'd take a pinch of snuff from his snuff box and with his little finger crooked, he'd put it on the back of his hand and sniff. Then he'd sneeze and sneeze. He'd put his nose in the air very hoitily and dance about the room, flipping up the tails of his coat. The red coat minuet, he called the dance. Come and dance the minuet, dear lady.